I hate tomatoes. And the reason why I hate tomatoes, I remember I was always told tomatoes were healthy, so I always ate tomatoes, but I never liked the taste. What I did, though, was I always bought tomatoes. And at university, when money was tight, I decided to stop buying tomatoes because I never liked them. What, fast forward a few years later, I went to my friend's farm. What he did, he picked up a cherry tomato off a tree. He wiped it and told me, have this. I ate the tomato, and anyone know the Ratatouille experience? Where you see fireworks because of the flavor of food? That happened to me. Every day from then on, I remember buying two pounds of tomatoes, cherry tomatoes from him, walking to all my friends and saying, you guys need to try this. I love tomatoes. But I also, while I hate tomatoes, I love to cook. Recently, I did a challenge. I spent one month trying to be vegan, only to find out, but vegetarian, only to find out that of everything that I bought, only one thing was actually bought, was actually farmed locally. On my plate, there was only one thing farmed locally, and that was mushrooms. Funny enough, everything else, apart from the rice noodles, could have grown locally. So we really do have a food crisis in the Caribbean. 80 to 60 to 80 percent of the food that we consume in CARICOM is actually imported. Only, only Jamaica and Guyana import less food than the rest of the region, which is about 50 percent. That accounts for four billion dollars in 2015. In 2020, it's expected to rise to eight billion dollars. Just imagine that means a hundred dollars in each of our pockets by 2020. What could a hundred dollars do for you per month in your pocket? For me, that's probably about a week's worth of food, because the food index price has shot up 157 percent in 10 years up to 2020, up to 2008. In the CARICOM, the top five imports are processed food, wheat, corn, meat, and rice. That's a complete change to our previous diets, but that also has had an effect on, what, on our health. Although undernutrition has, in, has decreased, we had an increase in child obesity, and non-communicable diseases have gone up. Seven out of every 10 people who die in CARICOM die from non-communicable diseases. That in that 60% of our health budget is spent on treating non-communicable diseases. And then we have climate change. 182 major natural disasters over the last 10 years, 90% of which could affect agriculture. So we have to do something about this. So we have come up with an idea. What could that framework look like in terms of, in terms of driving change and driving what driving change in how we, what we eat and what we import. And it all starts with awareness. People need to understand where their food comes from, what you eat, how it affects your health, and the quality of the food that you eat. So in terms of the platform, I think the first thing we start with is with an awareness. Then policy. We need to drive changes in policy. For one, I know Giles talks about organic food, but we need to understand what the standards of organic foods are, what makes food organic, and how does that relate to our context in St. Lucia? What is our relationship with the food we eat? But also looking at how, far, how farmers are funded. Are there tax incentives, subsidies, and loans that farmers can benefit from? How do we simplify the processes for importing foods or importing the materials needed for farmers to grow? Land use policies, we don't have, St. Lucia does not have a land use policy, but ensuring that we know which, farm, which lands are actually available for farming and how we can also increase economic development in rural areas through farming. Because in order to have access to food, we need money. And finally, in that slide, with the R&D incentives. We know that there is a lot of interesting things going out, but how could we start thinking of ideas that we could generate from the Caribbean and export these ideas? Earlier this, afternoon, earlier this morning, we were talking about linkages. How do we link? agriculture to other industries, especially the tourism industry, ensuring there's better communication among the different industries and creating new opportunities, whether it be new products and new market opportunities for farmers. Then we need to increase 
our local production. We need to train farmers on the various farming practices necessary to increase local production. We need to increase the number of farmers. Now that comes not just from asking people to start farming, but start teaching agriculture at a much earlier age. How can we start introducing agriculture curricula into primary schools or even infant schools? And in order to increase the health of the food, making sure that these practices are organic. And then there's technology. We can't compete in the Caribbean on, with large-scale large -scale farming. We need to start to increase our production per square foot. So technologies out there, whether it be the older technologies or newer technologies, whether it be aquaponics, IoT, or vertical farming, these are the, technolo the technologies that can help us increase our local production. And then climate change. With all these hurricanes and with all these things that affect us, what can we do now to start building resilience to climate change? We could adapt, we could mitigate, we could resist. However, understanding that we need to build resilience is the first step. So I'll give you a story, another story. I'd like you to meet Philip. Philip is a typical Caribbean farmer. He, hold, he has five acres of land, most farmers own large plots of land, but they're only able to practice farming on about an acre. Larger than an acre, it becomes a, very, a challenge to manage. What Philip's challenges are, Philip has, needs market insight. He needs to understand what to grow and when. He needs to understand the conditions that he's growing in, in order to make decisions, and he needs to manage his farm a little better. Understanding what, how he spends money, how he makes his returns, and the effect of everything that he does on his business. But what if you could farm from the palm of your hand? All right? What if you could farm from the comfort of your own home? Philip and I have, like, would like to introduce Farm Smart. It's what we call your team in your palm of your hand. What the technology does, it's an app which connects the farmers to the market. So now we can tr we get market data, trended market data from over a couple of months and the farmers can, and the app will then make recommendations to the farmer as to what to plant and when to be able to make the biggest profit. We then give the farmers sensors which they use on in, within, the, within the greenhouse or on the land and these sensors help the farmer understand the conditions that they're growing in and how to make these adjustments to the farm in order to generate more production per square foot. Once that's done, the farmer can now put that information back onto the platform for sales. And on the back end, if necessary, if you have automated equipment, the farm, the application can therefore help automate whether it be fertilization or irrigation of your, of your plant. And with Jeff, they've kindly funded a greenhouse, smart greenhouse project with, with for us. What that entails is having a controlled environment with a greenhouse, a specially designed greenhouse, using a condition and, a co and solar. The reason for that is plants at night need to slow down their respiration to, try to be able to transfer the energy collected during the day to the fruit. So during the reproductive stage, what we do is we close the greenhouse and we bring the temperatures down to about 20 degrees, so the plant energy is now utilized more effectively. So, what I'd like to say is, with all of this, in the end, what we're looking for is to ensure that everyone can enjoy my Rata 2 experience. Thank you. Don't, don't, don't go yet, Jade. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I'm sad you didn't bring one for everybody. <laughs> Jade is one of the young, bright, technically oriented young farmers who are emerging, on the field, emerging in the field in St. Lucia and his other partner is just like him. They are two of a kind. They work together in complete unison, one complementing the other. And I really admire these two young men. Next year we are going to launch this project in a big way because it's going to make a significant breakthrough, I think, for agriculture in St. Lucia and we look at the issue of patent as well. That's why Lee Fong, that's why you're here, and we're gonna be talking to you. So questions for Ms. Jade Hutchinson, comments, questions for him? 
Anybody wishes to go first, Mr. Singh? Thank you. Um, I'm very happy, you know, from, I'm from the education system, you know, to see some, you know, young farmers like Jade, and I wish we can have more of that. Um, Jade, you mentioned something about the curriculum, and that's uh, really sorry, you know, schools, you know, especially in primary schools, so maybe we need definitely an upgrade or a revision of the curriculum so we can put some more emphasis on this thing called agriculture in our school system. Because if you look at our primary school system, not a lot of schools are actually focusing on agriculture. They focus on mainly the academic. And this hands-on approach needs to be enhanced in our primary school. Because if you look at the stats at the secondary school level, not many students are opting for agriculture. Right? If you look at the top schools, HES or SJC, SMC, there are not a lot of students doing agriculture. But I'm telling you, the few that are doing agriculture, they do very well. They do very well. So we can get more young agriculturists from that level, from the young level, expose them to agriculture to see what is it, hands-on. Maybe all schools should have a little kitchen garden so they do both the theory and practice. And maybe you are from that school where you actually expose. So if you can share some of that, what you have done, maybe at the secondary school or the primary school if you are involved in agriculture early. So that best practice can be sent and, and shared to other schools so you can have more young agriculturists like you. Because that's really a shortage. And we have the talent, the skill, but we need encouragement from, you know, education, the curriculum revision to make it adaptable to suit the market and the demands, you know, for businesses and for the country at large to be sustainable. Thank you. Oh, just to follow up on your point, at secondary school, I went to St. Mary's. I did agriculture. And to be honest, growing up, I never thought I would end up in agriculture. I wanted to be an engineer. I went to school to study design. I came back. I started chicken farm. I left that, did some branding, came back, worked with my friend on his farm. So for some reason, no matter how much I tried, I always ended up back in agriculture. But what's interesting, Jeff made sure as part of our project that we actually develop a curriculum to train people on climate smart agriculture and how we can actually utilize more organic farming. So we're actually working with a Mexican institute to develop a certified curriculum for training people in agriculture, train farmers and students. And recently we've actually went to another secondary school to explain the project. When I walked in, I asked a question, who wanted to be farmers? And no one spoke about it. However, after explaining the technology and understanding that farming is not necessarily a balamine and a fork in the ground, that there's more that you can actually do, the response at the end of the lecture was completely, di completely different. I think there's a, there's the misunderstanding of what farming is, and also how much money you can actually make out of it. So, good point. I, I was once in a lecture where the lecturer showed a slide: people meeting in a boardroom. There are the fellas with the tie and the briefcase, the loyal and looking spectacles, looking at the other old fella, all dotted clothes, you know, old boots sitting down there. And he said, "Who you think?" Is the richest man there? <laughs> Everybody said lawyer, doctor. The farmer owned the company and was hiring all the sellers to work for him. So that was in um, um, New Zealand, by the way. <laughs> so, so these things happen. Questions, comments? Ah, Embert, excuse me. Yeah, two questions. One has to do with whenever slides, I think you had on the technology, you had IoT. Yeah. Um, but you didn't go into the you didn't elaborate to what extent that IoT plays, IoT is Internet of Things. Yeah. I presume that's how you're using the server, right? That it, what role it plays in your, in your project and technology? Yeah. Okay, uh, what we do is we've used, we use the Internet of Things to help collect data from the farm because big data is the more data you have, the more decisions you can make, the more correct decisions you can make. So we, within, this, within the greenhouse or open field, because the software can work in it either, we use sensors in the ground or within your growing medium to one, collect inf data on climate, um, nutrients, and, the f and what the app does, it takes that data and it provides recommendations to the farmer. So it's more than just saying that, listen, here is, you have X amount of nutrient in your soil. The answer, I think for, to, on the, for farmers, it's actually, what do I do? What do I do to make it better? So that's what the app, that's what the app does. So the, the IoT is literally, making sure that we collect data within the greenhouse, within your aquaponic systems, and how that data is shared. 
and yep. utilized. Yeah, my second question has to do with the taste of food produced under control conditions. I remember some time ago when we first were introduced to freshwater fish, and there was uh, some kind of re resentment, objection to freshwater fish. I mean, sometimes now you eat fish, you don't even know where it, came, it comes from. Um, to what extent have you been looking at that issue of taste, and whether there has been any feedback from your, your consumers or people who buy your produce, the extent to which taste, taste is a factor? I think we have to understand the difference between control conditions and just and on and growing for example growing organically within control conditions. So it's about making sure that whatever you grow that or whatever you prepare within these conditions get the nutrients that are actually necessary. So it's more than just saying, okay, I have enough light, I have enough things, let's make it grow quickly. But making sure that the nutrient value of what you're actually growing is correct because that's where the, the flavors come from, making sure that the right amount of nitrogen, the right amount of the plants get the right, the right, the right nutrients within their processes. And they get all the, the right energy profiles to ensure that they process that nutrient in the right ways. Uh, you want to see? Well, just to give an idea, we, um, in terms of the organic farming, when we, I mean, there's, I, I did it myself. I mean, my, when he, my, Keegan sold to many of his, yeah. many of his um, clients, and they've all come back and said the same thing. The taste, you could actually tell the difference in taste, whether it be kale, for example. Kale bought in the supermarket and kale bought from an organic farm. The length of time it stays, you, when, it starts to de when it starts to break down, the smell of the kale. Uh, I remember having kale from the supermarket, it would last me about a week, if so long. And you could actually smell the difference in how much chemicals actually put into the food. Yeah, I can vouch for the eating, um, um, but on that, on um, uh, organic lettuce, we have it at the aquaponics uh, facility in Lage. And ladies and gentlemen, when your body finds nutritious food, it tells you that. I don't know if you've ever eaten pure organic lettuce or tomatoes. You eat it, and your body shouts for joy. Believe me, I've had that experience. And then you see, Jade is a very good cook. We had a, a, a little... Uh, bring a dish kind of thing in my office where we were discussing the project and Jid brought food. Gasa, I still feel it in my belly. <laughs> it was so good, <laughs> you know. I mean, so Jid, if you have, he's going to make it well if he becomes a chef. So he knows the flavors and he knows how to mingle everything together. Comments, people, this is the future of agriculture in St. Lucia. When we launch in February, this is going to go because there is a learning component it's going to be a prime site for training, and we have started to replicate by doing a project in the Bellevue um, Primary School in Viewfort, and then we have, we're combining this with aquaponics. You might have seen the aquaponics model on the William Peter Boulevard. So we are bringing a network of those farmers together next year so people can buy within that network. And this afternoon, we're going to be launching the Organic Agricultural Network for St. Lucia at three o'clock right here, so please don't go. Questions, comments? Another thing I want to tell you all, you can actually study those tomatoes, Jade, you can correct me on that, and kale, and plot the energy profile and know exactly when to feed them so that it's the optimal, that's what you call it, the optimal point, yeah. where they, they will minimize the loss in terms of the nutrients you give them. And based on that, you all can use your app and so on. Yeah, you want to extend on that? Yeah, um, what the app does, it looks at the energy profile that a plant needs and how the relationships between all the different factors behave and ensures that we provide that in the correct amounts. Okay, um, good afternoon. Really great presentation and I'm very hopeful for the future of agriculture. This is the, this is the way I would want to see agriculture moving forward because it is very difficult to to entice or encourage young people to go to the lands with a normal hoe and a fork and hard labor kind of thing, right? So this is really exciting and very scientific. Um, I'd like to know how you came up with the app or if it was, if it was something that was already out there. Um, how easily transferable is the knowledge from you know, using this app? How, how, how easy it is to to train other young people into using something like this and uh, like you know just give me a little breakdown a little more about the app i'm not that you know 
tech savvy, so I'd like to know a little bit more about it and how easily it can be transferred so that this could be replicated. In terms of how we came up with the app, I was doing something on my own and Keegan was doing something on his own, but when we actually met and we had a chat, we realized that hey, we would, there were lots of things that we were doing which were similar. We actually won the CTEP, it's a CTEP, um, what's it called, the CTEP, it's an original competition for entrepreneurs, which we won the, the idea stage. And when, when, when the team did that, I brought Kegel on board because of what, because his knowledge is within farming. Um, but in terms of the, how do we learn, I mean, the app itself, what we, we designed the app to be as simple as possible. Uh, my developer just walked into the room, so he can vouch for that. I've been giving him a lot of work to make sure he goes back and make, to just to refine things. Being sure that not everyone might, it might not be everyone who can read, so make sure we include voice recognition. We show currently a lot of the work that's being done in St. Lucia is through WhatsApp in terms of connecting farmers and markets, but making sure that we, inc we incorporate all the small technologies that farmers are used to and giving them as many options to interact with the app. And as time goes on, we build the con and they build confidence within using technology, they can start to broaden how they actually use it. In terms of how, I mean, for young people, most of them can pick up anything. I mean, my nephew is six years old. He knows how to use probably the computer better than most of us. Uh, so in, in, as part of the training through the training curriculum we're developing, a lot of that will be done as well, training farmers on how to use the app. The app will be done, the app it actually will be selling that software as a service. So it won't be a one-off course. And that will depend on things like your farm size, how many sensors and how many sensors you actually need to use, and which platforms you're using. So in, in terms of the marketing platform, there'll be a, it, there will just be a small commission for using the platform. And the size of the greenhouse we're using, we're looking at about a thousand, thousand five, a thousand, a thousand five EC. That's about, I think about 400 US. But that, will, that, that includes the leasing of the sensors until you actually own them. So it's a lease to buy scenario. So it all depends what exactly you're using and how you want to use it. Thank you very much, Jane. Anybody else? So our farmers need to make money and we have to bring strategies, business strategies into the farm as well. So there's continuity and there's sustainability as well. So that is part of the whole process of Sustainable development, okay? We have funded part of it. They have come with the intellectual know-how. We funded it and mentoring them. And they're also working uh, to get in the St. Lucia Coalition of Service Industries because that, that is how the grant was given to the St. Lucia Coalition of Service Industries of which they are members and the project focuses on them. So it wasn't an individual grant to an individual person. It was given to a group and they are the two persons who are implementing that project with the group. And there's a benefit sharing arrangement between them and the group as well. And, so the, and there's one more thing to, to remember that what the app does, because you can grow, because, we can, you can, because you can manage your conditions a lot better, you expect to increase the production, that, the production that you have. So a typical, growing organically on the farm, a typical plant would produce five pounds per plant per season. If you pick up the seeds, the, the, the seed packet, a typical plant can actually produce 25 pounds per season. So there's a jump, an average jump of five times of the production. We did some, we did a, uh, some quick calculations in terms of the greenhouse that we have. We spent about between 120 and 150 in, the, in, the develop, in developing the greenhouse, all the infrastructure works. And based on the projections, we should be able to pay that off in, on the two, in about two years. There you have it, the financial analysis. So comments, questions? Using science, using business, using mentoring, using cooking, gastronomy, <laughs> and all of these go together to give us a product. But I'm sure um, what, what is important is for people to be able to come to the farm at Laguerre and do an internship, spend a week. So there might even be that idea of having some lodging there for, for people to come. And you're the cook, right? And Giles will be the first, the first student. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. I'm a student of life. Always learning, you know? So you all can all come across from St. Vincent. These are my two colleagues from St. Vincent. Or we might send you all across, right? So you to teach them. <laughs> Actually, from St. Vincent, we can always come across to help you develop your strategic farming framework. We'd love Indeed. to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, Jane Hutchinson, the future of farming in Salusa. Thank you very much, Jane. Really appreciate that.